Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing Chris Kai. Chris Kai is an entrepreneur, international speaker, and an Amazon number one best-selling author of Big Game Hunting, Networking with Billionaires, Executives, and Celebrities. Please welcome Chris Kai. Thank you. So you all ready for the best speech of your life? Yes. <laughs> we have that guy in the center who has finished his Japanese lunch, so we're ready to go. <laughs> All right, so my speech is called Catapult Your Career Opportunities, The Art and Science of Building Successful Business Relationships. So if your goal is to knock on Sundar's door today and say, hey, dude, I want your job, this is the speech for you. If you want to go to Larry and Sergey and say, hey, did you really have to change the name to Alphabet? This speech is also for you. It's all about how do you rise up the ranks in your career company or industry. So Michelangelo once said that the greatest danger most of us face is not that we aim too high and miss it, but we aim too low and reach it. And here are some really troubling stats that I found. 87% of people, according to Gallup polls, don't like their jobs. They call it disinterested or disengaged, where they're unmotivated, they're not passionate, and they just, some of them even hate their jobs. Newsweek said that 71% of Americans are either overweight or obese. So when I say in my speeches, I want to encourage you to aim higher in your life. This is the reality, but the future could be if you say, hey, Chris, my dream is to write my own book one day. My dream is to travel all across Europe, all across Asia. My dream is, again, to be Sundar or Sergey or Eric. And so if you want to do these things in terms of aiming higher in life, the best way to do that is to change your relationships in your life now. The best way to change your life is to change your relationships. So what I'm going to do today is go through five specific things on how you can go about building these strong relationships. Because at the core, it's all about those relationships. So when you hear things like, oh, Chris, networking is about who you know. No, networking is about who you want to know. And it's not about, oh, i got to work the room. It's about finding the right rooms to work. So this is based on a book I wrote. People always ask, Chris, you wrote a book about networking, and you called it Big Game Hunting, Networking with Billionaires, Executives, and Celebrities. And I said, yes, I did, because Maya Angelou once said, when you learn, teach when you get give. If I grew up middle class in New York City, my mother was a school teacher, my father was a case manager, I grew up with no access, no money, and no connections, but somehow I figured out how to secure these very large clients that make $100 million, or bring in Elon Musk to the worst part of town to interview him, I want to know that I can share things that I've learned over time because I wish someone wrote this book for me. And I had a mentor named Fred Joel years ago when I said, hey, Fred, I want to scale my company. What should I do? And he said, Chris, don't be shooting at rabbits if you want to hunt big game. Don't be shooting at these little opportunities. If you really want to scale your business, you have to hunt big game, which is aiming higher, which is why the concept of big gamer is just someone that you want to be like. If you want to write a book, that person that's an author is your big gamer. If you want to be CEO, that person is your CEO. If you want to travel the world, that adventure is your big gamer. So focus on the people you want to be like, because in time, you'll be that person. So we all know that networking is important. But based on science, your network is literally the number one best predictor for your career success. I was kind of shocked when I actually read about this guy because he actually studies networking. <laughs> he like studies networking. It's called network science. And he found that fundamentally, there's two paradigms. The old paradigm is you're in certain clusters. So for instance, I'm from New York City. Anyone from the East Coast? New Yorkers? All right, cool. So I grew up in Woodside, Queens. So that'd be my first cluster. I'm only hanging out with people in Woodside. Then I went to Catholic school, so I'm only hanging out with Catholics. And I went to St. Mary's and Munster School, which is I'm only hanging out with people from there. The new paradigm is, well, if I'm a Catholic, do I know other people who are Muslims, Jews, agnostics, atheists? So it's about branching out from your just singular clusters, like a neighborhood and school and, and, and religion, and going out to other areas of life that aren't like you. They don't think like you, they don't look like you. And so the beauty of this open network is this. And I'll give you a specific example. So I used to work for American Express at 40 Wall Street in New York City. So I was a corporate guy, go to the office, go to the cubicle, build presentations. 
And then now I'm building out an online training program where I'm totally online now, where I'm literally, I have 27 clients working with, where I'm building out how do you create this brand to create a price point that you want to be a great speaker around the world. And so from the offline world of being in the corporations to the online world where I'm like kind of clueless about this whole digital media. So when I had a chance to say, oh, I get to speak at Google, I'm like, oh, this is cool because maybe I can learn from people from Google. But at the core, I'll give you a specific example. My closed network is, OK, I take meetings, I go to coffee, I get into these various uh, conversations with how to scale a business that's a Fortune 500 company at American Express. The new paradigm for me, the open network, is, well, I'm going to meet a guy named David who literally sells smartphones. I'm guessing Androids, no iPhones. <laughs> but he sells smartphones, used smartphones on eBay, makes $20,000 a month. And another guy named Jeremy, he actually helped this guy go from $40,000 to $1.8 million in a month. And lastly, Matt, he does product launches. He helped his clients last year make like $8 million. So for me, being this offline American Express corporate guy, now I'm going online, these are the kind of people would be an example of my open network. If I don't meet these people, how can I learn to be like them, learn from them, because I'm kind of clueless relative to this online media. So as it relates to you, if you want to get promoted in Google, to give you an example, when I worked at American Express, there's various tiers for obvious reasons, right? So I was an analyst working on the banking side. And so it's as clear as day when my closed network, my cluster would be compliance, operations, bank at Seven World Trade Center, the third building that collapsed. The open network at the time was, I want to go to 40 Wall Street, which is where the corporate services was for sales. And I want to go to the financial center, which is where primarily everyone is, because that's where the headquarters are. So if I stayed only in my closed network, I would only know operations, banking, and that's in a separate building. But if I want to branch out, and I ended up literally going from analyst, I passed senior analyst, assistant manager, and to manager. It was, like a, it was like a diagonal move, which is kind of unheard of, because I just went out and met people that weren't in my closed network. So how this relates to you is you really want to start focusing on going to the people that you want to be like. And the thing with this group of whole, like the whole talks at Google's, I mean, I was talking to Elaine earlier uh, before this presentation, I'm like, I mean, you know how easy it is for you as Google employees? Like, if you say you want to work at a VR firm, you can literally branch out to these open networks and say, OK, what are the top five VR companies in the world? I'm going to invite them to Google. And you can literally meet the CEO or the HR person. So you have such a massive advantage over a lot of people because most people are just at their jobs in their cubicle or their office in their closed networks. They don't have the capability that you have as a Google employee to literally reach out to anyone you want in the world. Like, Alien was like, oh, Henry Kissinger over here, and Mikhail Gorbachev was here. It's like, I hope you recognize that if you want to branch out and have open networks, just use the name of Google because you can literally invite anyone you want. You can invite your future employer. So keep that in mind relative to open networks because the vast majority of people, they don't have this, this ability to work at Google and to have the opportunities to have an open network come to you, which is phenomenal. Second point is this. Your mindset really affects everything. And there's a woman named Dr. Carol Dweck who actually spoke here at Talks at Google. Based on 20 years of research, she fundamentally found two very basic things. You either have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And the fixed mindset is this. If I say I can't stop talking because when I was a kid, I would get in trouble all the time. I went to Catholic school, so they're pretty strict. Any, any people that went to a Catholic school with really strict teachers? One person? <laughs> So like, they're literally like, you know, Chris, you're going to stay after class and write, oh, I'm not talking class 100 times and 200 times. And my third grade teacher was so angry with me. Her name is Mrs. McArdle, bless her heart. She's like, Christopher, you're going to stay after class and write, I will not talk in class 500 times. So here I am as an eight-year-old with my chalk in hand and writing, I will not talk in class, I will not talk in class, I will not talk in class, I will not talk in class. I'm not talking about it. And so literally the whole classroom was filled with my signature. So fixed mindset is, OK, I can't stop talking. I can't do this. Also, they labeled me as having a reading disability. So now no, not only was I not able to shut up, I just felt that I was stupid. Literally, up until my freshman year of high school, when I got into honors English, I really felt that I wasn't very smart, even though I had all straight A's in school. I always had at least 95 and over. But yet I felt this fixed mindset because my teachers labeled me as having a reading disability. And lastly, the toughest thing growing up was I was really short. 
I was the shortest kid in all eight years of St. Mary's Elementary School, and they always lined up the shortest kid in the front. So the biggest insecurity I had, being short, they just literally spotlighted that, because they always had to line up in the front of, the, of, the, of, the, of anything, anywhere we went. And it got to the point where, when I got into high school, <laughs> I was 4'10 going into high school. Now, if you're a girl, if you're a woman and you're short, you can easily wear heels. But if you're a man and you're short, it's, it's not fun. It really is not fun. I went to an all boys school too, so it was even really not fun. <laughs> and I, I was 4'10, and the shortest kid next to me was 5'1. So he was considered a giant, and I was like a dwarf. And it got to the point where I went to a party one time, and I saw this girl, and she's really cute. She's wearing a, a black skirt and a white top and a black hat. And, and I, I mustered up the courage to ask her to dance. And, and she said yes. So I started dancing with this girl. I was all excited and happy. I was getting my, my, my groove on. And this upperclassman literally comes up to me, lifts me up. He's like, ha, 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 are you trying to pick up a second grader? And puts me back down. And it was one of those moments where I'm like, man, this is, this is painful. And so I could have easily stayed in this fixed mindset where I think to myself, you know what? This guy literally just picked me up while I was dancing with this very attractive girl, and so I should have a very low self-esteem. I should have this fixed mindset where I'm like, oh my god, I will never find someone cute again. I will never have the courage to ask someone to dance again. But thankfully, I had an uncle named Uncle Ding, who when I was 12 years old, he hired me at his insurance company in Lower Manhattan. Uncle Ding, while I was being bullied and teased and ridiculed for being short and talking too much, Uncle Ding was like, no, you're smart. You're confident, you're diligent. I'm gonna hire you and you're gonna help me build my company. So from Uncle Ding, I bought my first stocks when I was 15. I started writing my first book when I was 19. And I started my first company when I was 21. So with the growth mindset, when you have people like Uncle Ding in your life or a mentor of some sorts, you start thinking, you know what? If I get in trouble for talking, I'm gonna get paid to talk now because I'm an entrepreneur. I wanna learn how to learn better. And lastly, I'm gonna build my confidence on experience. You know, there's two ways to build confidence. The shallow way is, all right, I'm gonna wear a nice suit, wear nice shoes, therefore I have confidence on the outside. But that's very shallow. As soon as I get a zit on my face, and someone says something about my looks or my suit, it's like, oh, I don't really like that suit, then I'm, then I'm like, oh my god, my, my confidence lowers. <coughs> but the other confidence is deeper. It's through experience. It doesn't matter what people say about me in terms of my physical out, physicality. It's like, well, if I've built up experiences deep down, it doesn't matter because it's deep like a well, not shallow like a puddle. So when you want to build confidence, just remember, have that growth mindset because when you have a mindset of growth, it literally affects your self-awareness, your self-esteem, your self-expression. It affects how you deal with anxiety, depression, and it's all based on 20 years of research by Dr. Carol Dweck. I'm going to dial into this one point of learning from others. Now, how many of you have actually read these books because you're, you work at Google? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've read one of these books. Raise your hand if you've read both of the two, two of the books. Raise your hand if you've read all three books. Not one person? Okay, who read two of the books? Okay, I'm going to give you guys a free book that, that I wrote. <laughs> so the power of reading other people's books is because you learn about what other people do. So I want to stress that, again, since you work at Google, it's very easy for you to be like, ah, I work here. I don't, I don't need this book. But if you were to read Eric Schmidt's book, when I met him a few months ago, I'm like, hey, Eric, great book that you wrote. And out of the 55,000 words, there's one word that stands out. And that word is interviewing. He said that the best and most important skill to learn in business is to interview well. We all know that fundamentally. But here's a guy that's helming your company who, out of 55,000 words, said interviewing is the single most important quality you need to build your career. Because by interviewing well, you're qualifying the questions. So you would go to an interview. I talked to a few of you before the presentation. You said you might want to look for a different job. And if you understand that when you go to an interview, you're not being a passive interviewee. You want to be an active person. And you go in there. And just as much as they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them. And so when Eric says this is literally the single most important quality, be mindful of that because it allows you to qualify who the person is, if that person is going to hire you, if that person is going to create an awesome environment for you to work in. So that's the thing that I learned from Eric. Sprint is an awesome book where essentially it's like, well, if you want to really do a lot of things in life, just like do it fast. 
So you know, the rapid prototyping, this is like the kind of terms that the Google people always talk about. But it allows me, as a non-Google person, to just understand where, OK, if I want to start an online program, I'm just going to start it quickly. I'm not going to wait around to test things. I'm just going like, to create it, ask for opinions along the way, and you'll just learn more in that way. The next thing is this. At the core, networking is really about connection and community, about relationships. And so there are four happy chemicals where, again, based on research by a woman named Loretta Graziano Bruning. I wanted to make sure I get her name right. And they're called happy chemicals. We often hear of when you go to an event, you ask the question, hey, what do you do for a living? We always ask that question. Instead of asking that next time, I want you to ask, who is the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? Who is the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? And let me know what the response is. Because when I ask these questions, because again, it's about connection, I was in um, Israel and Palestine earlier this year for a US consulate event. And I actually got to visit Ramallah, Palestine in the West Bank. I got to speak in East Jerusalem, and then I got to go to Tel Aviv. So I got to see both sides, and there's a lot of conflict there for, 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 for a long time. And so this Palestinian woman who I met at a speech I gave in East Jerusalem, she had a lot of just <clears throat> sadness in her eyes because of all the experience she goes through with Palestinians, with Israelis. There's a lot of tension there. But when I asked her, hey, who is the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? She immediately lit up, started smiling. She said, oh, Chris, my swimming partners. Every morning when I wake up at 8 o'clock, I start swimming. And if I don't swim, I just feel anxious and depressed and sad. If I don't do this, I just, I just don't know what to do. But literally, her whole physiology changes. So when you meet people, make sure you talk about their interests and their relationships because literally their physiology changes. She doesn't even know it, but I can keep talking about her swimming partner. I can keep talking about swimming, her interests. And she wouldn't know it, but like, if I were to walk away from that conversation, she'd be like, wow, Chris was so awesome. We had the most amazing conversation. And all I was doing was asking questions about her, her interests, her relationships, but literally her physiology changes. The four happy chemicals, I use acronyms, D-O-E-S, does. Dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin. I read another book recently, because going back to the learn more, how to learn better, I didn't have a very good short-term memory, so I said, OK, I'm going to learn better, because I have a growth mindset. There's a book called Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. And they found that we forget more than 50% of what we learned in an hour, and 80% in a month. So when I use acronyms like DOES, D-O-E-S, I'm pretty sure you'll have a much higher chance to remember that then, oh wait, what, did, what were those chemicals that, that, that Chris said, uh, 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 happy chemicals? But if you remember does, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin. So next time you talk to people, start asking questions. Start asking questions about their interests, but especially their relationships. Because that is the single best way to connect more deeply, knowing those happy chemicals. Two more points I'm going to share, and then we're going to have a, a cool interview with Elaine. So tent pole stories are 22 times more relevant than facts. First of all, I'll explain what a tentpole speaker is. So when you go to events, the tentpole speaker would be like a Eric Schmidt or Sergey Brim or Sundar, right? They're the per person that literally props up the entire event. And so tentpole stories are, when you meet people, are you the guy or woman that says, when someone asks you, oh, how's your day going, Chris? I'm like, ah, it's not going, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's okay. That's not really rem memorable. When you share stories, you're just 22 times more memorable than everyone else. So keep that in mind when you go out and meet people because if you don't share stories about yourself or other people, how are they going to remember you? If they don't remember you, why are they going to hire you? So just keep that in mind. So let me dive deeper. So Carmine Gallo wrote a book called Talk Like Ted. He talks about these are the qualities that these TED speakers have. How many of you have watched TED Talks or like TED Talks? I mean, it's kind of like talks like Google, right? But at the core, it's three specific things. And he found that Aristotle knew about this 2,000 years ago. Three things, ethos, logos, and pathos. The ethos is the credibility. I can stand on stage here and say, hey, my credibility is I've given over 1,000 speeches. I used to work for American Express. I've written five books and published three books. I created this online program where I'm teaching entrepreneurs how to be speakers. That's the credibility. But that's only 10% of my storytelling ability. The 25% is logos. Logos is, well, this is not my opinion. The fixed mindset, the growth mindset, that's based on 20 years of research by Kara Dweck. 
the whole open network and closed network, that's based on research by a guy named Ron Burt. So when you have the credibility, that's 25%. But really, the fundamental difference between great storytellers, people that you remember forever, and those that aren't really memorable, is the pathos, which are the stories, the emotional appeal you have to someone else. And so let me give you some examples. Every single month, you should at least have one tentpole story. Every single month, you should have at least one thing to say about your life because if you don't have things to share, why would they remember you, okay? So let's say earlier this year, I was at an event at the White House. I was in Palestine, I was in East Jerusalem, I was giving a keynote speech to a global conference, but it's like things that I'm saying because you're, you're, tr you're trying to stand out. Next is my book, though it took me 20 years to research, it took me two, year, two months to write the first draft, and it took me four days to go from 400 to number one in four days. Now the rankings in Amazon, in case any of you might want to write books one day, the rankings in Amazon literally change every hour, but for four days in August, my book was number one. So it's a story. And lastly, Google. Like, I'm pretty excited to be here because Google has such a storied history and it's literally changing the world. And Robert Kennedy once said that few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can change and to work toward small events, small portions of events, and in time, history is written, the entire generation is, hidden, is written through small things that you and I do. But I don't know if you realize that if you work at Google, which you do right now, it's not 22 times more memorable. It's not 200 times more memorable. Like, Google is changing the world, so your story just being an employee, it's like 2 million times more memorable. And so the fact that you work here, the fact that you have books that are written about you, hopefully you're mindful that just like with me, since I grew up in New York City, it's easy for me as a New Yorker to say, yeah, I'm from New York, but I don't need to look at these historical elements. I don't need to walk down the block where Alexander Hamilton's grave sighted. I don't need to stand next to the Federal Hall right across the street from the Wall, Wall Street where George Washington took the oath of office. I don't need to know that Wall Street was based on the Dutch and how they were trying to protect themselves from the Indians, but I do know that because I'm a proud New Yorker, but I'm not taking that for granted. So I hope for you as Googlers, you know that the fact that you work at a company that's changing the world, your story is phenomenal. So make sure you embrace that. It's just, it's just inspiring. Like, I don't know if you know this, every single person I told that I'm speaking at Google, their eyes lit up. Going back to the, the happy chemicals. So know that that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing in the world. I mean, it's so easy for you to just be at your desk, but know that you're inspiring the world because every single person, except for maybe my mom, <laughs> who doesn't really know a lot about Google, so I said, Mom, I'm gonna speak at Google. It's like, what? But beyond, beyond that, like every single person is just excited for me to be here, and I hope you know the impact you're making in the world by being here, because that's a pretty amazing story. So lastly, I'm gonna share a secret power that all of you have. As I mentioned to you, I grew up in New York City, my mom was a school teacher, and she insisted that her three sons, I'm the youngest, learn Chinese. So on one hand, all my friends primarily were white, and you know, I had a friend named Jocko and Alan, and, Al, and Charlie Campiglia, and John and David Robinson, they're all mostly Irish and, and Italian, I went to Catholic school, and so all we did was play baseball and basketball and ride bikes, and so it was cool, right? Me, I did those things, but since my mom was Chinese, grew up from Hong Kong, she's like, you're going to Chinese school. So I went to Chinese school for 13 years, and I hated it. Three hours a week for 13 years. There's penmanship and all these things for things you have to do, but thankfully my mom didn't want me to live in a country where though she was proud that I was American, she wanted me to know my culture. And there are stories where I remember I was 11 years old, she liked to knit. So she'd be knitting away, knitting away, knitting away, and I was here just like being annoyed and I was just, just, just like scribbling on my paper, refusing to do my Chinese homework. And my mom just kept knitting away, knitting away, knitting away. And then I was just like 10 minutes later still dribbling, you know, just scribbling on my piece of paper. But over time, my mom just insisted on having me do my homework. And so I'm grateful for my mother because she insisted that I learn Chinese. And so I'm fluent in Chinese, both Mandarin, Thai Chinese, and, and Cantonese, which is like a pretty rare breed for what they call, what they call an ABC, which is an American-born Chinese. And the reason why I share this with you is because the secret power, the special power that we all have, is that we should listen more. You know, this phone that we have, the smartphone, there was a, an Android company called Locklet. They surveyed over 100,000 users, and they found that the average user checks their phone 140 times per day. 
and the high frequency user charges, checks his phone 900 times. So a character like this is pretty interesting because at the core, Chinese is kind of like Tetris. It's not really one character. In this case, it's like six characters, but I'm going to focus on four specific areas. So the obvious one is the ears, right? We're going to listen with our ears. But the less obvious is you're not just listening with your ears, you're listening with your eyes. Right below that, it says focus, but it's actually not focus. It's just a character for one, meaning you're focusing on that person with one undivided attention. But the most important quality, the most important Tetris block in this entire character is heart. If you do not listen with your heart, you're not really listening. You know, we live in a world where if you watch the news, which I don't watch, I don't even have a TV, if you watch the news, it's all about our amygdala and the fear-based things. And they do this deliberately because what bleeds leads. So you watch any news, and you're like, oh, there's some shooting, there's some fire, there's some terrorism, there's some politics. So it keeps you in this fear-based mentality, this whole fixed-based mentality, right? But if you listen with your heart, you will have so much more richer conversations. You will connect more with your coworkers, your colleagues, your community. And so that's the thing I want to leave you with. Please try to listen more in your lives. Put your smartphone down, put your iPad down, put all these things down because the more you're inundated with all these distractions, you'll never be able to hear your own voice. And the irony of life is this. Only in silence can you hear your inner voice. I was up in Alaska for a speech two months ago. There's a place called Earthquake Park. If you ever go to Anchorage, Alaska, it's about five minutes off the, the Anchorage, Alaska airport. It's one of the most serene, peaceful places in the world. It's based on the, it was named after a 1964 earthquake, and so they named it Earthquake Park. It was the second largest recorded earthquake in all of history, and the largest earthquake recorded in North America. It was about 9.4. And so 50 plus years ago, it was this massive earthquake where literally the entire earth cracked open. But when I was there, it was about 30 degrees, and I remember walking through this beautiful trail. It just snowed, and, and the seasons are changing. And I remember how peaceful it was. And I can listen to my own voice, because too many of us are distracted. Too many of us are bored. Too many of us are just going to the next meeting, going to the next job, going to the next thing that, that excites our mind. But you will never listen to your own voice, your own heart, your own purpose, if you don't push away those things. So please do your best to listen with your heart to other people and to yourself. And the last thing I'm going to share is this. I'm all about taking action. We talked about closed networks and open networks. You want to do more in life, you want to be more successful, you want to have more promotion, you want to make more money, have more open networks, which means meet people that don't look like you, meet people that aren't in the industry, your nationality, your income bracket. And so for you, I challenge you to meet one new person a week. In a month, you'll meet four. In a year, you'll meet 52 people. And those 52 people will be 52 different doors of opportunity for you to catapult yourself in your career in your life, and in the world. Thank you so much. So of course, the first question I must ask is, who is the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? <laughs> you know, it's funny. It would actually be myself, because I'm very introverted. Like People find that shocking that I wrote a networking book, but yet I'm introverted. Because when you realize you really do have a purpose, which we all have, I like reading, I like meditating, I like walks. So I actually like spending time with myself. Outside of yourself, who's the next person that you like spending time with? My, my students that I see every Monday at this homeless youth program I started, where we teach career and life skills mm -hmm. for teenagers that live in the worst part of town in downtown LA, where they live in the large shelter. Because when you see these kids, it just puts everything in perspective. You know, like I was, you're giving me this beautiful tour in the facility, and I'm like, what are some of the unique benefits that Googlers have? Like, oh, we have laundry and masseuses and food. I'm like, so it's easy to just blend in. And, oh, yeah, that's, that's life. But I mean, when you see homeless kids that have been abused and, and neglected and are hungry, and, and it just puts everything in perspective. So that's, those are the people that I most love spending time with. Well, that's great. Um, and what is, what is your story of the month? This actually, your, your tent pole story of the month. This, well, so this week actually, I, I'm, uh, my birthday is actually coming up on Saturday. So like, I'm speaking four times this week, and but this actually is, is a great honor to be here at Google because, like I said, as I said to you before, Robert Kennedy has said most people don't have the greatness to shift history or bend history, but you guys do, and I really hope you appreciate that power. That that's why this is definitely my tent pole story for the month. Absolutely. 
listening to you talk, um, it sounds like you love to talk. Even though you're <laughs> introverted, you've loved to talk all of your life. And was there a time that you envisioned yourself doing what you're doing now? Well, I always envisioned myself as an entrepreneur, and that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. I mean, I've been in probably nine different verticals. It's just that when I, 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 I think I, the, the shift happened when I, when I was, you know, doing so, somewhat okay at American Express, and I was being an entrepreneur. But the, the, the side of the altruism wasn't there. And since I do meet a lot of billionaires and executives, you know, the thing that is most lacking in a lot of their lives, if they're not happy, is a cause. So you can buy the nice car, buy the nice house, have all the beautiful women in the world. But if you don't have a cause you believe in above yourself, then you're going to feel empty. How did you first realize you could use your relationships to create the success that you have today? Well, people kept asking me, to be honest. Like, they're like, Chris, you, know, you go to all these phenomenal events. You know, how do you do this? And again, going back to Maya Angelou, when you learn, teach, when you get gift, at the core, we all have gifts. And so if I have this gift of connection, why would I not share that with other people? So when I started realizing, like, it's kind of crazy that I can leave American Express and get hired as a consultant for a guy that makes $100 million by myself. You know, when I started getting all these various opportunities, I'm like, you know what? How can I write and publish books when I've never had any person in my family be a published author? But when I started making the connections, like what Steve Jobs once said in his Stanford speech, he said, you know, you can look at the, you can connect the dots looking back in your life, but you can't look, connect the dots looking forward. And so, so when I started connecting these various dots in my past, where I'm constantly going from this career to that career to this industry to that industry, I'm like, wow, it always came back down to my network and my connections. And then when I look at the people like Warren Buffett and, and Reid Hoffman, it's consistent. Those that have the most opportunities have the most relationships outside their networks. What made you decide to write the book? Was it a person who suggested it? What, did you think of it yourself? Well, again, it, it, it's, it's the constant like, demand question, you know, like in any business, it's just very fortunate that people could ask me, you know, can you, you know, Chris, you got to write this book about it. You do it so well. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then I'm like, I'm a business guy. So I'm like, all right, can I monetize from it? Is it something that I want to do? And so even with this, this online training program, same thing. I, mean, I speak all around the world now. And Chris, like, you seem to have this great, this personality. Can you teach people how to be a speaker? So for me, it's really about going back to like, what do I enjoy to do? What do I want to do? How can I help people? And if I can help people and make a good living, why wouldn't I? So since you have um, so much experience with networking and observing people mm -hmm. networking, what would you say are the three biggest uh, problems or mistakes that people make when they're networking? The first one is people don't research the event very well. You can literally go online and research who's there, whether they're senior executives, junior executives, managers. So the first thing is, going back to the question I had before, the statement is, working in the room is a waste of time if you're in the wrong room. So I see a lot of people that are working hard where they go to an event, but they don't actually research who's there. And then they wonder why when they get the stack of business cards, it goes nowhere. They're like, oh, well, maybe you should research. Secondly is, they don't really have a clarity in themselves. Going back to you know, listening to your own voice. You know, if money is your option or money is your influence, then, well, you should just be focusing on people that make a lot of money. And there's no judgment on my end, for instance. So like realtors, for instance, I have a lot of real estate clients. I'm like, well, if you want to sell a billion dollar property, then that person in the room needs to be making at least $150,000. And so if the person in the room is not making $150,000, why are you even there? So there's a level of clarity that I think people lack, too. And the last one is 80% of people would be more successful if they followed up. Like, if you want to take a stack of business cards next time, you should just literally look at the business cards like they're $100 bills. And you literally just throw them into the waste paper basket because you're literally throwing away money if you don't follow up. It's not just one follow up. They've done studies where like, they make the sale after the fifth to the twelfth follow up. So what do most of us do? We barely even follow up with one card. But like, if you follow up two or three times, or even two times, you're like, well, but I don't want to bother them, Chris. Well, what if they think that I'm annoying them? I'm like, do you ever get emails where you don't respond to? I get emails from my own mother or brother that I don't <laughs> respond to because I'm busy or I'm traveling, right? But the point is, it's our own internal fixed mindset. So the three things are, do more research, have more clarity in terms of the why you're there, and lastly, follow up because you're literally burning away cash if you do not follow up. So a follow-up to your follow-up question is, um, <laughs> what, what are some tips for following up? Like, do you... Just send an email, or are there a variety of things that you do? Great question. So I have an acronym. As I mentioned, I love acronyms, because we forget 50% of what we learn in an hour. So my acronym is avenues of follow-up. 
A stands for articles, V stands for videos, E stands for events. If I have a client who's having difficulty motivating his employees, I'm like, hey, Doug, here's an article about how do you motivate your employees. If Elon Musk has mentioned that you know, I have difficulty sleeping, I'm like, hey, Elon, here's a video that might help you sleep better. And events are the best. Events, you can never replace this. No matter how advanced we get as people in terms of technology, nothing will replace this. So let's say I want to continue to build my network one of my clients, well, one of my friends, her name is Angie, she's the former CFO of, of Coffee Bean. Uh, sorry if the Starbucks fans are here. <laughs> but these people are busy. But I'm like, hey, Angie, Jack Welch is speaking in downtown. Do you want to come? So now I'm giving her something of value. She wants to meet people like Jack Welch. She comes. Oh, surprise, surprise. I meet an executive there because birds of a feather do flock together. I meet City National Bank executive there, and City National Bank manages about $30 billion in assets, one of the largest banks in LA, and I secure them as a client by going to what I call a big game event. So here I am giving value to my friend Angie, who goes to see Jack Wells, so she gets value, we get to both you know, witness this, I secure a client. But most people don't do that. They don't research, they don't think about giving, they th think about take, 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 take. So avenues of follow up, keep it simple. Articles, videos, and events. That's why I send the newsletter out literally to like my newsletter list. I'm like, look, just use what I've researched because I want to add value to people's lives. What's the niche that you're filling there with, with starting that online speaker program? So, so all of us have a, a message to share. All of us have a gift. And a gift is like a seed in your hand. And if you don't plant it, you're not really living out your purpose. And so I find it unfortunate that like, you can have the intention to do good in the world. But if you don't have the competency and the skill set and the step-by-step -step process and the strategy, you don't get there. And so if I'm literally speaking all around the world now and other people I meet want to do the same, though they might have the intention, if they don't have the competency, it's not possible, which is why I wrote my book about networking, which is why this program, I mean, to be, for me to be able to start a program within just six weeks, and the online training industry, by the way, is a $107 billion industry. So if anyone wants to make good living, go online and train people. And I already have like 27 clients in like seven weeks from 25 cities, 14 states or provinces in four countries. So to be able to scale that much, since I do want to go global, it's one of the most inspiring things. And since I have a home office in Beverly Hills, it's like I travel, but then I'm just hanging out at home. <laughs> so we have never been in a better place for entrepreneurs. So the fact that you work at Google, the fact that you're in the online world, I mean, really appreciate, and everyone that's watching, appreciate the moment we're living in right now. It's literally one of the most beautiful moments in mankind. You'll never hear that from the news. When you look at the arc of history, we're literally living in the most unique time in mankind. Um, what do you think is the purpose of life? And what is really the cause that you believe in? And how, with what you do and what you shared with us doing here, you're connecting the two. So I really fundamentally believe that all of us are here to serve. So our purpose is to serve. So when people say, oh, Chris, you know, the purpose is to be happy, I don't, I don't agree with that. You know, when Dr. King is being bombed or stabbed or being threatened, he wasn't happy doing that, but he was purposeful. And so my purpose in life is to serve. And how do you serve? By having the gifts that you have. So in my case, if my gifts are writing and selling and, and creating programs, that's the platform I use. So I always say, like, my platform is entrepreneurship. My purpose is service. And on a macro level, I'm going to create a United Nations meets the girl, Boys and Girls Club organization to train student leaders to solve the world problems. And so that's my macro purpose goal. Now, I really believe that all of us have goals and all of us have purposes. But again, we don't spend enough time on our own by ourselves. I do spend a lot of time on my, by myself so because I know that I wrote my own eulogy when I was 23 at my grandmother's funeral. And so when I've already seen my physical demise when I'm age 23, which is a long time ago, it doesn't matter what I do from this point because like, my purpose is so clear, which is why when I was telling Elaine, like, the reason why I used to talk a lot was because that's just who I am naturally. But now that I'm more um, experienced relative to just asking myself what do I want to do with my life, because we don't know how long I'm going to be here for, right? We always assume, oh, I have tomorrow, I have next week, I have next month. I'm like, no, you don't. There's 2.5 million people who passed away last year, according to CDC, that probably thought they would be here today, right? So if I have this very somber awareness of me not potentially being here tomorrow, next week, next year, then I'm going to make sure that I serve the best I can, given what I have now. And since entrepreneurship is literally like so limitless, and education is my purpose, then that's the path that I'm moving toward. 
Hi, one of your points was that when you talk to people, they're, they talk about interests and their relationships. So how do you talk about relationships without sounding like too personal or too like in their business? Like, what are your tips for that? Well, see, here's the thing. Just the fact that you asked that question, that's a fixed mindset. What, what is a personal question if, let's say, I met Terry Hatcher, right, the actress, and I asked her, her daughter was there. I'm like, oh, tell me more about Emerson. Well, Emerson loves to do nonprofit work, and Emerson loves to volunteer at the children's hospital. So, I mean, if you're asking a question kind of tactfully, then it's just asking a question. But at the core, I keep it simple, where it's like, if let's say I meet you for the first time, what's your name? Anthony. I'm like, hey, Anthony, that's a cool jacket. Is that personal? Well, like I said, if, to, to make it a very simple segue, you can literally say, and people have done this, they're like, oh, I was watching this talk by this very, this very handsome, charismatic man named Christopher Kai. <laughs> and um, he said, you know, instead of asking, what do you do for a living? He said, why don't you ask, uh, what's, who's the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? And that's it. Literally, you can just segue. Like, I was just at this talk, and this guy was talking about networking. And instead of asking, what do you do? Why don't you ask, who's the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? And one of two things will happen. You know, one person would just be like, well, one of three things would happen. One, 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 one option is, well, they're just going to be shocked and just be annoyed. Second is, they'll be shocked and go, that's an interesting question to answer. And the third thing, they'll just answer it. Because it's going back to the whole courage aspect. Like, if you're not used to asking questions, you might think, like, whoa, I wouldn't really feel comfortable telling someone who I feel, who I want to most spend time with. But I think you should try it, because I have had many clients do that. And it's phenomenal, because the alternative is this. Especially with realtors or people that I meet, like before they even ask my name, they say, what do you do? <laughs> they're, they're already making it transactional. And with realtors, if they do that, if they ask me, what do I do, I say I'm a speaker. They're like, oh, I don't need the speaker because uh, I need to sell a house, and he doesn't have, a, I don't know, speakers don't make a lot of money. You know, so they kind of like pigeonhole hold themselves out of a conversation. So I always just encourage you to just be bold and be daring. And just say, literally, I was at an event with Christopher Kai, and he said, instead of asking what you do, what kind of, uh, who's the one person you most enjoy spending your time with? And see what happens. I'll be shocked to see if that doesn't change the dynamic. And sometimes it's just profound, because people aren't used to asking deep questions. Like for this woman here to ask a question about the purpose of life, that's awesome. But because I read a lot, like Albert Svetzer once said, you know, the only people that I know that have been truly happy are those who found a purpose to serve. You know, but most of us don't think about that. And when she asked a question like that, I'm very grateful. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming out. Um, my question is around: you left us left us with a thought, and that was go out and meet someone new every week. Um, I've actually had that as a goal of mine in the past, and I think it's a great aspiration. But it doesn't seem as practical once you get into the you know month three, and you're trying to like you're really forcing. Um, kind of action that you wouldn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as natural. So I wanted to understand from you what your strategy are, strategies are to do that. And then um, as a follow-up, what do you do to maintain those relationships? And are there any examples that you can give? Yeah, well, I have these two-part questions. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first thing is going back to like know what you want, right? Going back to the purpose, right? So for instance, when I go out, my, my life is so much more intense now, so really, I only go out when I'm there to speak or to find speaking opportunities for the most part. So just first understanding why are you going out to meet people, right? But it goes back to what Steve Jobs said. You can't connect with that looking forward. I'll give you a very specific example. Um, and, and by the way, there's three categories essentially, right? It's business stuff, personal stuff, and philanthropic stuff. So business stuff is like, okay, can this person be a potential client of mine? Personal stuff is if they're cool and interesting, because if they're cool and interesting, I want to be cool and interesting, therefore I'm going to be cool and interesting, right? The birds of a fly the flock together. And lastly, philanthropically, will this person be a cool speaker for my program? So for you, it's more of like, okay, well, why are you going out there? So at least you have some level of direction why you want to meet them. But then, like I said, you never know who you're going to meet. And when you say, well, it kind of, it kind of gets imp like impractical, but it just goes back to, well, what is practical and what, do you, what kind of questions are you asking and how are you engaging with that person, right? Because I was on a train ride from Boston to New York a few years back, and I was coming back from my cousin's wedding. Sitting next to me on the Accela train, which I highly recommend doing because when you're on the plane, there's all these annoying things you have to do, but when you're on the Accela train, it's just like smooth riding, right? I'm on this train from Boston to New York for about three and a half, four hours, He's unfortunately coming back from his father's funeral, and he's going back to DC. His name is John. And I ended up talking to him. I'm like, this guy used to be a former Navy SEAL officer, former sniper, 500 missions, has a consultant firm, and just a really cool dude. 
And I'm like, all right, I don't know how I'm going to do business with the guy. I don't know if it's going to be practical for me to know him. But we stay in touch because interesting people do interesting things. And so we stay in touch. He's in DC now, has a consultant firm. I have a friend at the time named Corinne. She's in LA. She's a law student. She's going to DC to try to find some jobs. And hey, Corinne, you should meet John because I think he might be a great contact for you. They ended up dating and now they're married. <laughs> you know, so that's the story of how, like, if you only look about, oh, what can I get out of it? You know, how come it's not practical? I'm like, you know, I look at it more from like a karma standpoint. You know, like if I give my book to someone that I meet for the first time, like I gave the book to me and the first person who came here, you know, that's the impression he give, he gets of me, right? So it still goes back to, you know, what's the purpose of you going out there and who do you want to meet in terms of your industry or direction, whether personally, philanthropically, or professionally? And then, like, what kind of value are you bringing to that person's life? If the person has difficulty in relationships, are you helping them? Because it's like, if Google is like, I actually I don't know a lot of people from Google, but I mean, if, if you're not used to meeting people and it doesn't seem practical, then I would ask and probe deeper, well, who are you meeting? And what kind of value are you adding to them? Because I can talk to anyone in the world and find something of value if I'm willing to listen with my heart. I don't think a lot of people do that. And the second part of your question was what? Oh, it was just uh, strategies for following up with people. Yeah, I mean, keeping it simple, like I said, avenues of follow-up, articles, videos, and events. I mean, how awesome, <coughs> how awesome is it if, if you tell me, oh, man, Chris, man, I want to go on a cool vacation. I'm like, oh, yeah, would you like hot weather, cold weather? Oh, I, want, I want like a really cool place. I'm like, oh, you should go to, um, hmm, Australia's coming up. I mean, it's just like if you actually took the time to listen, it's, it's just fun. And you'll get to build more relationships because we live in a world where it's so easy to be alone and lonely. But also, if you actually remember that we're all fundamentally human beings, no matter how technologically savvy we are, we're still mammals. We still have the same things we had 100,000 years ago, which was like, oh, I'm hungry. I need food. <laughs> there is a perception that uh, people in high places have a game face and are hard to crack through. And you need to be really in the inside circle to connect. Um, but do you get that? Are they pretty straightforward, child at heart, ready to talk? Or do you really have to use the right keywords to um, go deep? Right, keywords. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, see, the, the title of my book, you know, Billionaires, Executive Celebrities, it's like a catchy title, right? But at the core, like, Eric I met before, Eric Schmidt, and he's kind of standoffish, but he doesn't know me, right? Patrick Sinchong is, like, so it depends on the person, but at the core, it's like, I don't know, some of them I know as friends, some of them I don't, right? But it's still about accepting that, okay, if they're in a public setting, it's a different environment. If they're in a private setting, it's very different, so depending on how well you know them, some of them are just genuinely really nice, and some of them are a bit standoffish, but they're standoffish because I'm standoffish sometimes too because if I don't know you, and what happens a lot is like, especially with billionaires, executives like Elon Musk, they see this a lot. They see people who like, like the kind of like the groupy face. And so if you have that kind of expression of this, this fanatical, oh my gosh, then that's not something you want to do because the worst thing you can do is treat them as someone like a deity which is what a lot of people are treated like. Like they put them on a pedestal. I don't care if you're Elon Musk, Malala, it doesn't matter because they're still people. We ourselves, in our own mindset, oh my gosh, this is much better, smarter. I'm like, Elon Musk might have more money than me, maybe he's smarter than me in certain respects, but I still see him as Elon Musk as a, as a human being. So, so I would suggest that, you know, to answer your question, some of them are, are really st standoffish, but that could be a function of just being in a setting that's very public. Because trust me when I say, some people that want to be famous and want to be this level of uh, income, you're like an animal in a zoo constantly being chased. I was just in Art Basel last weekend, and Paris Hilton was there. Hey, Paris, what's going on? Because I met her before. But she's being stalked everywhere she goes. And so if you were in her shoes or a billionaire, it's pretty hard to deal with that, which is why they have bodyguards. you know. And, and I see why, because you might just see them one time, but they might see 500 people. I'm not Elon Musk, but I see a lot of people too. And sometimes I've definitely been told I've been standoffish, but I'm like, that's their opinion. So Christopher, I really have enjoyed your talk so much and you're so charismatic and you've lent so much um, wisdom to the group. My question is, you mentioned that you're an introvert and as an introvert myself, I was wondering if you have any tips um, for introverts who can sort of break through um, their introvertedness because we're gifted in different ways to help with 
relationship building and networking because to me the word networking is um, a little bit of a it's a four letter word. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it goes back to the fixed mindset, right? So two two suggestions I have is this: one, hang out with Aaron, you know more. Like like Aaron's a friend of mine. But what I'm saying is you go out with someone that's outgoing, who makes you look good, and so like you go out with someone who's naturally outgoing. Like whenever I go out, I always tell my friends just just hang out with me because I'm happy to introduce you to people, right? So one is go with someone that's generally outgoing. And the second one is just be more selective with your events. You know, because so many people I meet, they're always like, I got to go here. I got to go there. I'm like, do you? You know, it goes back to like, I don't have to go anywhere. If you want to meet more clients, or if you want to meet more customers or colleagues, just be really clear, like, is it worth your time? Because we only have 24 hours in a day and 160 hours in a week. And so the two suggestions I have is meet people or friends you have that are generally more outgoing and just say, hey, do you mind if I tag along with you? I'm trying to get better. And then two is just be more selective. And the final bonus is, is just you can't get better at anything if you don't do it a lot. And that's kind of why I suggested the call to action. Just do one thing. And, it, and honestly, it could be as simple as when you're in an elevator, and we've all had this before happen, you walk into an elevator, you see someone there, it's awkward. But why not just say hi? Or you're walking down the street, and someone's walking by you, why don't you say hi? I mean, it seems so simple, but those little tiny moments of courage will affect the other bigger moments of courage in that you have to start somewhere because too, too many people, they just they freeze up. Even with me, it's like, oh my god, Chris, you know, you're, you're, you're so charismatic. You, you're flying to Australia by yourself. That's so crazy. I'm like, don't compare you with me. Like, I've been doing this for a while. It's more of like, well, if courage for you means talking to someone literally in the elevator, just saying hi, that's a start. Because too many people, they, they get too judgmental and they get scared. I'm like, look, don't compare yourself with me or anyone. Compare yourself with yourself yesterday. And if you're introverted, you've already admitted and accepted, OK, you have a self-awareness. Next thing is apply what you want to do better. And the last thing is make it a habit. So start hanging out with more outgoing people. Set a goal. If it's not once a week, maybe it's once a month. But you have to set specific goals and you have to take action because if you don't take action, all this up here just prevents us from doing things that way. Hey, Chris. Uh, my name is George. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, just like you said, if you want to be good at something, you got to do a lot of that. Um, so we'd love to get your advice on this uh, for us. If we want to be a better speaker like you in the future, speaking at events, what can we do right now to create opportunities to start to speak at conferences, events. Right now, no one's inviting us. But how do we create that opportunity? How do we put ourselves in that position for the future? So George, I recognize throughout this speech because, again, going back to like physiology, you always want to find people in the audience that you can kind of go back to because George was like, yeah, he's all amped up. So thank you, George, for your enthusiasm. <laughs> so two things. My program is to teach me how to speak and get paid for it. So that's a different kind of advice. But if you want to just say, how do you be a better speaker, you can join Toastmasters. Toastmasters is a nonprofit. They have organizations all around the world. It's like less than $100. And they codify how you go about public speaking. They'll say, I want you to do a seven minute introduction. I want you to do a seven minute speech using your body language. I want you to do an inspirational speech. So from a codification system standpoint, Toastmasters is the most economical way for you to be a better speaker. Now, to get paid as a speaker, I tell my clients all the time, like Elon Musk is not a great speaker, but he gets paid really well. So what I'm saying is, you don't have to be a great speaker to get paid, but you have to have a great message, and you have to have authenticity. And so I hope that you can build your speaking <coughs> skills in Toastmasters and just doing it more, but don't ever lose the authenticity. But if you want to get paid as a speaker, it's simple. You're providing a solution for someone else's problem. The example I use with realtors. They want to find more affluent clients. They don't know how. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to follow up. I give them step-by-step -step processes on how to get them to those right rooms, just with my program. My entrepreneurs, they might be C-level executives. They might be very influential people, but they've never gotten paid, so they don't even know how to ask the right questions. So it's kind of two different questions. Basic one is join Toastmasters or take an acting class, because at the core, speaking doesn't really get enough of, of the, the praise it deserves, in my opinion. If you see a great singer, a great dancer, you're like, oh my god, they're amazing. But a speaker, we can all do it. But to do it well 
is a different class because it's still a form of art. And when I have people in the audience crying and people quitting their jobs, that's not by, oh wow, Chris is so natural. I'm like, no, that's a thousand speeches 15 years later that no, now it looks natural. So just know that, make sure you have fun doing it and don't be so afraid because when I first started giving speeches in high school, the first time I was literally outside the, the classroom hallway, shaking, stomach ache, sweaty palms, pacing back and forth with my head down, and, but that was a long time ago. So just, just keep doing more of it, but make sure you share things that you're passionate about because if you share things you're passionate about with purpose, you don't have to worry about that. And I'll just share one final thing. The reason why most people, in my opinion, fear public speaking more than they do death is because when you're in the audience looking at me, you might say, oh, I don't really like the suit he's wearing. I don't really like the shoes he's wearing. I don't really like <coughs> his hair. You know, we're being judgmental. But I'll tell you from experience, because again, I've given so many speeches in, the, in, in, in life, it's about the message. You know, I can be like six foot five and like 500 pounds, and maybe you look at me in a certain way, but if I have a core message of truth and honesty, authenticity, that's the thing that you have to focus on because I, <coughs> I meet way too many people that have way too many gifts and talents and special uh, unique qualities, and they're literally cheating the world out of a gift. So that's why I'm so passionate. I'm like, do you realize how amazing you are? I'm gonna tell you today, tomorrow, next week. Great, that's a great way to end it. <laughs> We're amazing. Thank you very much.